please join me in welcoming Zach Ward. Hey. All right, how's everyone doing? Good. Um, uh, thank you very much. I only have a few slides, so I won't need this uh, for the entire time. Uh, but a couple, a couple things about me. I am a comedian. I also do not wake up at 7.30 on a Friday morning, as I am typically performing around 10, 11, or midnight on a Friday night. Uh, so this is a very interesting morning for me. But I'm very happy to be here, and I've actually had creative mornings on sort of my radar for a very, for a very long time. Um, the thing that we're going to talk about today is uh, one of the organizations that I work with, which is a spin-off of the comedy theater called Yes and Life. And Yes and Life is inspired by the principal tenet, the foundational uh, belief of all improvisation and comedy, and that is yes and, positivity, unconditional support in order to create art by committee. So that it's not one individual artist on stage, but there are a group of people who have agreed to support each other's ideas and see what they can make possible by taking a chance and saying yes in a situation where they might otherwise say no. Where they might otherwise protect their own identity, protect their own ego, and put up walls to assert some uh, short-term authority and cause that uh, to break down. So we're going to practice yes a little bit today to get over the mystery of how does this work? How does improvisation happen? Uh, and a lot of people say, because we actually have rehearsals, we practice much like a basketball team practices but has no idea how the game will actually play out. We practice the skills of improvisation just to get that into our muscle memory. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to practice that a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to say creative mornings, are you ready? And I want everyone in the room to say, yeah, yeah, as loudly as they can. <laughs> And even though you may be seated uh, or against a wall, I want you to kind of rock back a little bit while you say it, right? Hips out, right? <laughs> In a way that may, might make your neighbor feel a little uncomfortable, but feels, feels freeing to you. So, creative mornings, are you ready? Yeah, yeah! <laughs> okay. Uh, so in that space of actually asking are we ready and whether we're ready or not, saying yeah as enthusiastically as that, we trick our brains into being ready. So the idea of engaging in positivity and creating a space of yes and, bringing yes into your life, can get you over the hump of any obstacle or hurdle you might be facing. So how many in the uh, room, and raise your, by raise your hands, uh, remember the movie Braveheart? Braveheart? Great. Braveheart is the last movie Mel Gibson made before he went crazy. Now, <laughs> in the movie Braveheart, Mel Gibson leads a band of Scottish warriors against a battlefield to face an English army ten times their size. And what they do is they paint their faces blue and white, they raise their kilts, I'm not going to ask you to do that front row, uh, and they scream and holler and they psychologically prepare themselves for the possibility of success. They run across the battlefield and what happens? Time after time, an army a tenth the size wins. And this movie, I watched 13 times. <laughs> if you remember this movie coming out on VHS cassette tape, it was two VHS cassette tapes. <laughs> That's a long time. I spent a considerable amount of my time watching this movie, which now as a 39-year-old, I kind of regret, but... It definitely had an impact on me in what a small group of people could do to fight and do something that they believed in. So what I believe in as an artist is not only doing art myself, but enabling other people to find that possibility, to find the space inside themselves that they can get over whatever obstacle, whatever hurdle, and get into a more free, open field and run. So they're not on the edge of the field, at the edge of the woods, thinking it's so scary out there. I'm vulnerable. In the woods, I'm safe. At home, I'm safe. Behind this spreadsheet, I'm safe. <laughs> but out there, who knows what might happen? And where other people say, who knows what might happen, and they stay at home, I say, who knows what might happen, and get giddy. Yeah. <laughs> right? And when I play these games and I engage in creativity, I engage in creativity much like uh, an ADD puppy, <laughs> right? 
And so in, in, as soon as I create something, I say, well, there it is. Well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What can I do next? Ooh, great. Yay, play. What can I do next? What can I do next? And this is how if you engage in yes and, if you engage in positivity, if you constantly get over that hurdle, then it starts to generate its own energy. And the energy of creativity, as most of you in this room know, begets more creativity, begets more creativity. And the more positive we can be, the more positive reactions we get, the more positive reactions, responses that we get, the more likely we are to take a chance on something that would otherwise stay dormant in the back of our brains. So we're going to practice this game of yes. We're going to come up today, Creative Mornings, with an issue that we all need to solve, an everyday issue. Not one uh, like the president, but an everyday <laughs> Uh, issue like my alarm clock went off. I actually, uh, I do this for a lot of organizations. Yesterday I had a meeting at the School of Government at UNC Chapel Hill uh, and we're all in the room. It's all the, the elephants in the room. What's happening uh, with four people resigning from the State Department? Uh, and the person that I'm meeting with is like, in this room, I am nonpartisan and value neutral. In this room, I am nonpartisan and value neutral. <laughs> and they, st they were staying, staying the line. So it's very interesting. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know how to talk about. We don't know what place is safe. We don't know who actually shares these, these values. And when I talk to municipal leaders across the state of North Carolina, I walk into the room and say, who are you and what do you stand for? <laughs> so what, in all of these spaces that could create negativity, how do we create and embrace uh, a spirit of positivity no matter what? A spirit of acceptance, of listening, of active support, so that you can identify with and empathize with anyone no matter what they may stand for today, hoping that we can meet them there and walk them out of that issue that they're facing, um, whatever it is. So we're going to practice the skill of yes. Uh, so give me an everyday problem. Uh, my alarm clock won't go off or any everyday problem, anything at all. Traffic. Traffic? Great. So the problem is traffic. So we as a group are going to solve the problem of traffic. We're going to come up with a creative item that solves the problem of traffic for everyone. Now, no matter what happens, whoever yells out something first, we're all going to say, yes, that's amazing, no matter what it is. OK? Uh, hold on. <laughs> right? uh, after someone yells out, we'll accept that, and then I'll ask you another question. Someone answer that question. The first person to answer, we're all in the room going to say, yes, that's amazing, then we're going to move on. And we're going to come up with an object and an entire plan to bring that object to market, and hopefully we can do it in two minutes or less. We'll see how it goes. So the first thing I heard in the back room is jetpacks. Everybody, yes, that's amazing. Now, we can't just have a jetpack because there are jetpacks, but we have to have a brand name. What's the brand name for this jetpack? Streamer, yes, that's amazing. Now, when I was growing up, things had bylines. We had rice aroni, the San Francisco treat. This is the jetpack called Streamer, but what's the byline? Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Yes, that's amazing. And this jetpack called Streamer, let's get out of here, uh, is going to be marketed by a B-list celebrity, not an A-list, but a B-list celebrity. Who's that? John Stamos. John Stamos. Yes, that's amazing. And some people in the room are like, I don't know. All right. All right. Uh, so John Stamos is marketing this. Now the jetpack is packaged. It doesn't come in a box. What does it come in? Tube. Tube. Yes, that's amazing. And we're going to reach the market uh, with John Stamos, not with traditional advertising on television, but how are we going to reach them? Podcast. Podcast. Yes, that's amazing. So John Stamos is going to have a weekly jetpack podcast, <laughs> right? Uh, and how much is this jetpack going to cost? $59. $59. Yes, that's amazing. What color is it? Blue. Blue. Yes, that's amazing. Give yourselves a round of applause. Great. Uh, so even before we began, we're in a room full of creatives. So the guy's like, jetpack. I'm going to go to a meeting today, and I'm going to say jetpack. I don't know. I don't care what the meeting is. I don't care what the content is. I'm going to yell jetpack. But we had Jetpack, we had Yes, That's Amazing, we had Streamer, Yes, That's Amazing, Let's Get Out of Here, Yes, That's Amazing. And with each consecutive question I asked, you guys were really into it. <laughs> but the time it took for people to contribute started to go down. The time it took for people to contribute and the number of people contributing went up. In two minutes, the idea of knowing that no matter what my idea is, no matter what I share, no matter what I offer, the group is going to say, yes, that's amazing. Well, hell, let me give it a chance. <laughs> and so the time went down, 
the number of contributions go up, and the next thing you know, in two minutes or less, we have a possible solution for traffic. <laughs> Now, are $59 blue jetpacks marketed by John Stamos going to make it to market? Yes, yes. yes. Realistically, I don't know. But that's not the issue. The issue is actually being able to collaborate and create an atmosphere where these contributions are supported, not because of the value or correctness of the contribution, but by the fact that they were contributed at all. Because what happens typically is we'll say, all right, we need to solve, we need to solve traffic. Jetpack! And we're like, all right, Todd. Right? And then, <laughs> uh, who invited Todd to the meeting? <laughs> and that would get thrown out immediately. And then people would be like, oh, Todd. And they wouldn't really contribute because they'd be talking about the no that someone else got. And then Todd, eventually, if you say no to Todd's crazy ideas again and again and again, well, he goes and starts his own startup. <laughs> and meanwhile, you're stuck in your job, and Todd just sold his jetpack business. <laughs> so in the spirit of celebrating and acknowledging and affirming people's contributions, whether or not they actually have value ultimately is what we need to do to set up a culture of positivity, a culture of unconditional support, so those contributions keep coming. And here's, uh, so I went into this like positivity, unconditional support space. Um, and the, the mystery aspect is that who knows if it'll work out? Who knows if John Stamos will even sound good on a podcast? <laughs> right? I think it'll sound pretty good. I think he'll be, <clears throat> I think he'll hand it, handle it. But in this situation now, we have all those contributions. We have a full idea on the table. And then we do it again. Let's solve traffic a different way. We go through the entire process. We have a full idea on the table. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. In a 30-minute meeting, maybe we have 10 full ideas on the table. And some of them are so wild and crazy they're clearly not something we can do right now, but they're out there. And so the process of yes and, the process of unconditional support, does not preclude uh, saying no. It does not mean we, can, we can't ever say no. But we say no for three very specific reasons. We say no because of budgets. We only have the amount of money we have. We say no because of schedules. We have a deadline and we have to do the things we have to do. And we say no because of the law. These are the only three reasons we have to say no. Every other time we say no is a personal preference. And so check that. Check that for yourself. Are there things that I've said no to that have not been over budget, not been against schedule, and not been against the law? Well, that's a personal preference. So did my personal preference of saying no in this situation shut down people that would otherwise contribute and make my life easier at other times? If I have the opportunity to say yes, I should, in my own self-interest, say yes instead of no. Because the sugar rush of the short-term no, I promise you, does not outweigh the benefit of the green vegetable yes, <laughs> which will be much better for everyone, your body, and the environment, the work environment that you're in long-term. Because if you set that person up to feel supported and feel successful, then Todd's like, oh, you like Jetpack? I got a million, <laughs> right? And just starts giving ideas. When I was in high school, I had a 200 CD collection uh, in a Case Logic CD case. You remember these, right? Zip up CD case. You're like, how the hell am I carrying this thing around? And this CD case was in the back of my 1983 Honda Accord hatchback in high school, 1994, stolen. Oh, man. Stolen. De oh, man is right. It was very depressing. I replaced every single one of those CDs. And it cost me thousands of dollars because I had a proclivity for double CD live bootlegs of Dave Matthews Band at the time. <laughs> I'm just being vulnerable with you guys, you guys. I just, you know, I'm being honest. But I had an inordinate number, 
half of my collection was hip hop and half of my collection were bootleg double live CDs. <laughs> All stolen. Then I replaced that. College, sophomore year, CD case, stolen again. Oh. Right? This is what happens. And then I felt justified in all the Napster downloads, right? <laughs> I was like, I'm not paying for music, I already paid for it twice, right? So I'm downloading all this music. I lived on my hard drive. And then I got a generation one iPod. That whole 200 CDs now fits in my back pocket. And then the iPod moved into my iPhone. And now I actually have a new iPhone and I didn't put any music on it because I just stream Spotify or Pandora whenever I want. So I don't even have any of those CDs ever on me at all. Because someone said jetpack in a meeting. Because someone said, how do we solve this 16 year old's kid, kid's problem of having a 200 CD case logic case stolen from his Honda Accord hatchback? <laughs> how about we have music in a pocket? What are you talking about, Todd? <laughs> And that happens. We say yes, we put it on the table. Maybe it doesn't happen in 1994. Maybe it doesn't happen in 1995. But a couple years later, it starts to happen. And that gets brought to market. And then Apple becomes one of the most important companies in the entire world. So the idea of creating a space where things that would today seem impossible or seem crazy, it's not so far off that those things are not just possible, but are the things the world needs to have in order to make a huge, giant next step forward. But in the short term, we don't have time. In the short term, the mystery is, how am I going to get done all the things on my task list with the short, limited amount of time I have today? How am I going to have three hours worth of meetings in the next 30 minutes? And so the crazy ideas become annoying to us. The crazy ideas become frustrating. They become a waste of time when we don't have enough time anyway. But we need to carve out space to say yes instead of saying no. Carve out space to accept the idea of the jetpack instead of casting it aside. Because that idea in your back pocket will cause bigger things to happen for you. So we're going to practice this one more time. I want to solve one more problem. What's a problem? We had traffic. What's another problem? Laundry. Laundry. <laughs> Great. If anyone yells out jetpack, I swear to God. <laughs> Great. Uh, so what's the, what's the product that's going to solve the issue of laundry? Disposable clothes. Disposable clothes. Yes! That's amazing! So we have disposable clothes, and what are they called? What's the brand name of them? Trash. Trash. Yes! That's amazing! Uh, now, trash has a byline so that we don't clear, we don't confuse it with actual trash. Uh, what's the byline for trash? What? Be like a bird. Yes, that's amazing. So disposable co clothes called trash, be like a bird, uh, marketed, marketed by what B-list celebrity? Who's this? Danny Glover. Danny Glover? Yes, that's amazing. Uh, and uh, it's marketed through what channel? We had podcasts before, what now? Tattoos. Tattoos, yes, that's amazing. So we hire people who are willing to be tattooed just to market these disposable clothes. Uh, and <clears throat> but through the very nature of the clothes, when they take off the clothes, bam, what are you doing? Well, read my back. Uh, <laughs> now, how much do these disposable clothes cost? $29.99. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, and where can you find these clothes? Walmart, yes, that's amazing. Uh, and Walmart, you actually don't go to a Walmart to get them. How do, they, how do you get these clothes? Jetpacks. Jetpacks, yes. <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. All right, great. Uh, fantastic. So uh, again, uh, the confidence with which you yell out jetpacks. <laughs> The confidence with which you yell out an idea uh, is the most important. And not shutting down that confidence, not creating an atmosphere where that confidence is diminished in any way. Um, so going into this space, uh, oftentimes I will say that we do say yes, and then we say but. We say yes, and then we say, however. <laughs> And I will, I will ask you for the rest of the day today and for the next week to count the number of times people in your life say yes, but then give you a condition. 
because those in my life are sneaky nose. <laughs> sneaky nose. And sometimes they even feel worse than just hearing no outright. Because the yes on the front side, though there would be some communication experts who would say, well, I want you to pat it with positivity, <laughs> then say no, and then still make them feel supported on the other side, right? Which we all know is a shit sandwich, and a shit sandwich <laughs> still tastes like shit. You could have the most delicious artisan bread on either side of that, it's what's in the middle, right? And obviously there's a lot of nuance to how we communicate with each other, with our peers, with our bosses, with the people that we uh, have working underneath us, our vendors, collaborators. But sometimes the yes, but fills them with hope. It fills them with the idea that I'm going to be supported. And then that but or however, instead of feeling like transparent, honest, straightforward communication, feels like a slap down. Right? So I would just encourage you to count those because those are coming from yourself too, but from other people that you work with in a way to say, oh, I'm positive, I'm positive all the time. But never is it a yes and. Never is a yes and here's how we can do it. Yes, that's a wonderful idea and here's what I can do to help you explore that, help you heighten or raise the stakes of that situation before I push my own agenda. And so the yes but, the yes however, is a pseudo positivity that's opening the door for them to ram their own agenda in, in the second half of that statement. So just count those. And remember that the three ways that we can justify a no is budgets, schedules, and the law. And this doesn't have to be the legal law, but it could be your own moral, moral or ethical law, right? <laughs> Values that you hold true. And sometimes we know that we have the legal law, we have schedules, and if the budget's right, well, those two things don't matter. No? Okay, thank you one person for laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but for people in the room, if the client has enough money, we can get it done on schedule, <laughs> right? Whatever deadline. But you have these three things and you want to work to identify, is it really, uh, is it really some opportunity for me to say yes or do I have to say no? And that's it. Um, so what I do for this is I do it in comedy. When I do these trainings and get you to uh, work in that communication, it's just to understand where that other person is coming from, to know that sometimes it's in my best interest to, if I'm a selfish human being, which we're all selfish human beings, if I empower Todd to yell out Jetpack, if I empower everyone in the room to yell out and contribute, then ultimately I have to work less. If I say no to them and shut them down, then they stop contributing. And the contributions in the room go down. And then, even though I'm surrounded by all these employees, all these collaborators, I find myself working by myself. And that's the last thing I want to do because I don't have enough hours in the day. I'd rather go play. I'd rather go to rise and get a donut. <laughs> I'd rather play with my four and a half year old son than say no and just shut down an idea. Right? So think even in a selfish space, it's in your best interest to say yes. Because you empower more people to collaborate with you and with more collaborators your workload goes down. In the short term it's not as obvious. In the short term it's annoying. Right? You're, you're pulling on my time. But in the long term, it works out for them, and it also works out for you. Thanks. That's it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I think, <laughs> so the biggest thing of this is uh, everything is uncertain. Nothing is for sure. No one knows if these ideas are going to work or not. But embrace the uncertainty. Embrace the uncertainty, live in it, have more fun in it. I promise you it's more fun to say yes than no. Uh, we saw that today. Um, so go in, count the butts, uh, not in that way. Uh, <laughs> count the butts, say yes more than you say no. Um, and if you have the opportunity to say yes, that's amazing. 
surprise someone. I actually, uh, this was, there was like five, there were five years of my life that people were like, Zach, you're embarrassing me. Because I high five literally everyone I see. <laughs> and so I would go into the grocery store and I would check out and I would high five and the person behind the counter was like, what are you doing? I'm sad. <laughs> like, uh, and, and obviously, you know, in an age of Purell, not everyone wants to touch everyone. But I was just like, the high five's there. If you want it, you got it, right? And so, yeah, there we go. Yeah. And, and so that is the physical equivalent of just saying, yes, that's amazing. Uh, so if someone comes up to you with an idea today, just go, yeah, that's amazing, and freak them out. <laughs> Freak them out with the kind of positivity you can bring to the table. Like, what happened? Well, uh, Sarah said, yes, that's amazing. She never says, yes, that's amazing. In fact, she rarely says, yes, right? Uh, but go over, get over that hurdle, get over that hump, uh, and you'll be surprised what happens. So, awesome. that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, any questions at all? What's my favorite pizza? Uh, I, I'm chicken, bacon, and pineapple. So I, this is my like, favorite, I like my pizza well done. So I like, uh, I like chicken for the protein, I like bacon for the salt, and I like a little bit of sweet. <laughs> so that's it. I'm not, yeah, that's very, I've thought about that a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah. My favorite comedy movie? Oh, that's a, interesting. I, here's, Here's the interesting thing you'll, you'll find about comedians. Comedians don't enjoy comedy. <laughs> so uh, I recently um, saw Underworld. <laughs> right? Thank you for the couple of yeses and the one man fist pumping in the back. Right? So uh, I'm, I'm very much into sci-fi, fantasy, science fiction, like science fiction, uh, that world, because I like, to Im I like to imagine other worlds that actually exhibit human truth. So what I do on stage as a comedian is I bring these absurd scenarios, scenarios that are not role-playing actual things that you would see, uh, but different characters in a different environment. But if I can get a critical mass in the audience to identify and relate to the human truth of those crazy characters, then we're all gonna have a good time tonight. And so in that situation, I often get like, uh, comedy, okay. <laughs> uh, but if it's a really compelling uh, science fiction or fantasy movie, uh, then I'm into it and the human truth is what pulls, pulls me in. Yeah. You are very positive and supportive. Were you raised in a positive support? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I think, those things, and you'll hear like sort of um, what happens with a, a specific childhood, what happens with a specific childhood, and can go like it could have gone either way, right? Uh, I moved all up and down the East Coast. Um, not a very open communication channels with my with my parents, and at times uh, sort of a very negative physical relationship. Uh, with, with one parent, and out of that, it was this situation where you're like, well, I'm not going to do that, right? And so um, you probably, as creative types, will uh, relate to the idea of creating microcosms, microcosms that you can live inside and create your own reality. And so uh, as a beginning comedian and improviser, I did theater, and in, that, in the arts, I would create these microcosms, and those microcosms were my escape. They're the world, the rules of a world that I wanted to live in, and I pretended and would make believe inside those worlds. And then those worlds were so safe and supportive for me that when I got to college, I started teaching Odyssey of the Mind, if some of you are familiar with that program. So I started another fist pump in the back. <laughs> so I, I started teaching applied improvisation to help kids problem solve and collaborate and succeed more in Odyssey of the Mind. And at that point, I'm, I'm like 20. Right? So I'm doing that and not knowing why I'm doing this. So I started doing comedy and, because I could get laughs and that meant people loved me. And I taught kids because I was in college and needed the money. And, and then I kept teaching those kids and then kept doing comedy and realized that the thing I like to do most is make, people lo make people's lives better. Uh, and the vehicle that I had to do that was the comedy that I had developed inside. Um, so yeah, I hope that's a medium length answer for that. Uh, yes and then yes. I was going to ask, how does the concept of yes and work in conversations and questions and negotiations? 
negotiations with your four-year-old son. Yeah. Uh, I could talk for three hours about mindful parenting practices. Um, so earlier, earlier this year, it, it, it's a consistency of behavior and staying, staying present and being calm and positive regardless of the scenario. And so I'll see myself in contrast to uh, really great friends of mine that are not necessarily able to be the most positive parents at all times. And uh, a, a toddler is able to pick up on those in the same way that an audience can pick up on a lack of confidence in a performer. So myself as a performer, I feel with my son, since he was very, very young, uh, it was putting on a show, and the show needed to be, how can dad be consistent? <laughs> how can dad be positive, unconditionally supportive, empathetic to what you're going through, and consistent in application of the rules that we have in the house? Uh, knowing that there's some flexibility. And so he knows now that if he's having a tantrum, it's okay for him to be upset. It's not okay for him to yell at me. It's okay for him to yell, but it's not okay for him to yell at me. Because I can't respond to that. I can't respond to yelling and I can't understand it. So I'll just tell him like, I'm waiting. Whenever you're ready to talk, I'm here. And I might say that 30 times. <laughs> and I'm holding out my hands. And, and the, I guess one of the issues is people that think they don't have enough time, right? right? I got to go to work. We got to get in the car. Will you shut the hell up and get in the bath? <laughs> right? We feel that. You can never say that. And in creating that consistency in that space, you have to be willing to be late. You have to be willing to carve out time on either side or build in those buffer times. And if you don't need them, awesome. But if you need them, they're there. And then you've provided that open space for them. And so right now, at four and a half, he's, it's been so consistent that he just trusts the way in which we interact, which I'm very, I'm, I'm very proud of. Yes? This is more of an existential high five to you. <laughs> because today's my first day. I have heard about this creative mornings from many different areas, and my sweetheart took me today. I just wrote a speech yesterday on Yes And. Oh, wonderful. I just a blog post this morning on Yes And and about the embracing the other. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> working in the theater, I too have taken the nuggets of theater and the creative essence of problem solving and being so present because you never know when somebody's pants mm -hmm. are going to rip and yeah. parts are going to fall out on stage <laughs> and then and a wig slips off that you have to bring that. This got to weird for everybody. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. And to bring that into the, into the, mm -hmm. the world, like the rest of the world that everybody lives in and so yeah. just a Big. No, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so, like, yeah. Um, I know there was. Yay! Great. Um, I have time for like one or maybe two more. Qu one or maybe two more questions. I know there's a hand in the back. Uh, yes, and then yes, and then we're done. Yeah, um, so one thing that I, I didn't get into today but was the principal exercises with uh, some of my corporate clients is going into a reflective listening exercise. And so the reflective listening exercises uses yes, uses yes and to literally repeat verbatim back to the other person what they've said from their perspective. Um, so it does two things. So if you were to make a statement to me and I were to say yes, as enthusiastic as I can, like, I'm so excited I heard that. And now I'm able to repeat back what you said verbatim from your perspective, uh, which means I don't have to agree with you, but I do have to acknowledge and affirm that you believe that. Mm -hmm. Right? So if someone, for example, were to say, Trump is the best thing that ever happened in the United States, I would say, uh, yes! <laughs> you think that Trump is the best thing that has ever happened in the United States, and I would have to explore that idea. <laughs> So give us an right? <laughs> we don't have enough time. But, but in, in, in giving yourself the freedom to know, uh, I don't have to win this conversation. I don't have to win this day. I don't have to win this week to actually make uh, my time here valuable and to have a successful year. Right? But so many times we get caught up in the, in the no, 
right? That uh, we want to defend and say, that's wrong, you're absolutely wrong. And we're worried about this conversation, and so we stop having empathy. We stop showing compassion for the other person because in the short term, it hurts us to have our values challenged. It hurts us to think that we might have to uh, sacrifice our own perspective just to listen, right? Um, and so going into that reflective conversation, reflective listening, and give back to that person. It also does one thing, again, part of my um, thing is how do you do this if we're all selfish human beings? Mm -hmm. That sometimes, especially when it's really critical information that someone's sharing, repeating back to them verbatim from their perspective gives you one more chance to hear it so that you can respond effectively. So if you're thinking of like, how do I do this? What's, what's in it for me? Repeating back to someone builds trust with them because if you do say no, you're saying no to something you actually heard, not saying no just out of hand. And it gives yourself one more chance to hear and process that information. Um, but empathy is not something that you learn today and then are able to practice tomorrow. Empathy is something that you have to consistently uh, work at. Right? Consistently put yourself in another person's shoes. Consistently say, yes, there must be something that has caused them to believe this. Yes, there must be something that has caused them to act this way. Um, and see if you can be there with them together. And like I said, walk out of that situation hand in hand. Yeah, I had one more um, yeah, question. It's more of a comment. We are um, the Emerge team, and we are creating a collaborative <coughs> creative space mm -hmm. um, in order to um, enrich people's lives and allow them to get in touch with their kindergarten selves and create. So I'd like to know how I can pull you in and have you <laughs> to our team. <laughs> Great. Hire you and yeah, so it's uh, very easy. I'm at Zach Ward at okay, Twitter. Right. Um, or you can find DSI Comedy is the theater. So if you go to DSIComedy.com, you can um, find me through there. Yeah, it was fabulous. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, You're the best preacher cool. ever. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll stick around, so I know everyone has to get to work, uh, but I'm going to stick around here for a little bit, so if you want to talk to me after, I'm here. But thank you to Jonathan, thank you to Creative Mornings, and thank you so much. <laughs>